Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. And even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop. Oh, you are a maker, a miracle worker. You promise me light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Oh, you are a maker, miracle worker. You promise me light in the darkness, my God. That is who you are. Oh, that is who you are. 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 Oh, that is who you are. 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 Oh, you're a miracle worker, God. You're a promise keeper, God. Yes, Jesus. Even when I don't see it. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. stop, you never stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. Yeah, Jesus, I thank you that there's power in your name. I thank you that there's authority in your name over everything that can be brought into this room, that can think that it can come against you. Everything that is not of you, I say that you bow to the name of Jesus because Jesus, there is power in your name. As we stand here in truth this morning, Jesus, I just give glory to your name, the name above all names. Jesus, you are King of Kings. And if you're here and you don't know that, I just pray in Jesus' name that he reveals himself to each and every one of us in such a powerful way this morning because that is possible and all things are possible with you, Jesus. We love you.
Never stop working, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop, you never stop working. You never stop, you never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You never stop. You never stop working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't see it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. Oh, you are. He's the way maker. He's the miracle worker. He's the promise. 
his keeper, he's a light in the darkness, my God. God, we thank you. That is who you are, Lord Father. God, we thank you, Lord God, that your promises are true, Lord Father. Your promises and your truth are not based on our feelings. They're not based on circumstances, Lord Father. They're based on who you are um, and the truth of who you are, Lord Father. God, we thank you. Um, Lord God, when we come before you, we, we lay our foundation on you, Lord Father. God, you don't leave us. You don't forsake us. Lord, Father, you don't abandon us. God, we might not always be able to see the light, God, but when we are built on you, Lord, when we are found in you, we are held by you. God, you carry us through, God, and we thank you that the promises that you've given us, Lord, Father, are dependent, Lord, Father. We can depend on them, Lord, God, despite how we're feeling. God, and even this morning, God, we don't always feel like coming here and worshiping. We don't always feel like coming here and declaring who you are, God, but it doesn't change the truth of who you are, God, based on our feelings, God. We sing about who you are because it's true, not because of how we feel, but God, I pray as we hear from um, your words this morning, Lord Father, God, give us hearts that are open, God, uh, to see past our feelings, Lord Father, and to hear uh, the truth of uh, what you have for us, God, the truth of who you are, God, um, and just help us to uh, be mindful of that, Lord God, not to be closed off based on uh, feelings or being overwhelmed or whatever it is this week, Lord Father. God, help us to push that aside, Lord, and be able to focus on who you are, God, and what you have for us, Jesus. In your holy and precious name, amen. You guys can take your seats. Good morning. Uh, my name is Justin, and just wanted to share a few words with you as uh, we're about to move into a time of communion, just to kind of focus our minds and hearts, just so we're not just doing things, you know, just going through the motions. Because sometimes in life, there's a lot of things that we do just going through the motions. I mean, have you ever really thought about, like, the, the things that you can do without even thinking about it, right? You don't even have to think about it. How many of you can walk now, at some point in time, though, you had to think about, see, there's one person in the room, he doesn't know how to walk yet, right? He's got to learn this. He's got to go through some training. And um, there's just lots of things that are like that. Even driving, it's kind of a scary thought, but sometimes you don't even think about it. You just do it, right? Because there's all kinds of things that you can do, and you don't have to think about it. E even these guys up here on stage, because of their training, they don't have to think about the chords they play. They just play them, right? Because it, it just becomes a part of your memory. And and, and, and there's so many things in life that, that are just trained in us. And we can do it without even thinking. And some of them are good, some of them are bad. Like, uh, another good example is this, is that all of you, you decided this morning to put on clothes. Thank you for that. <laughs> Thank you for that. But you didn't have to think about it, did you? <laughs> there's this passage in Ephesians um, where Paul, and we're, we're focusing on the series because he's like a mind warrior, we said, right? But he, he shares this example that all of us get, because all of us, we put on clothes, right? And he gives this example. This is what he says. He says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off, take off your old self, which is being corrupted by its e deceitful desires, but to be made new in the attitudes of your minds, and instead to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. He gives this idea that, that, that this idea of, of maybe changing the way you think, that there's some of the things that we think, and, and we do without even thinking, that they aren't right. Sometimes we know they're not right. But, but he's saying that there's a way that you can actually take those off and put on something new. And, and he says that it, it could become as, you know, easy for you as the same way that you put on clothes every day. But it, it only becomes easy when you do it over and over, when you repeat it. And when you repeat it, it can be just something that just becomes a part of your, your normal routine. You take off the old, put on new. And, and I love that, Paul, he gives some examples about how do we do this. E even the very next line, he says this. You must put off falsehood and speak truth. Or, or towards the end, he says this. Don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And don't grieve the Spirit of God whom you were sealed with for the day of redemption, and said, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, 
along with every form of malice. Instead, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. That's why this is such a great reminder for us as we move into communion. Communion is an opportunity that we have to remember, to focus on the truth that God, he loves us. And he loves us enough that he was willing to die for us. And he, he says, you have things in you that are false. There's beliefs, things that you hold on to that are hurting you and hurting others. Malice, rage. The truth of the matter is, is that we know that. We, we feel these things in us sometimes. Sometimes the, the things that we say, this is talking about the things that we say to others, but sometimes it's, it's also talking about the things that we say to ourselves. Because sometimes the things that we say to ourselves is, oh, yeah, God can never love, no one can ever love me. There's all these things. And he's saying, no, take off the old self and put on the new self. And he uses this, this example. Look at Jesus. He was willing to take all that old, put it on himself, so that you could experience something new. He came back to life, and he says, trust me, but you got to put it into practice. And so as we go in communion, take some time to do that. Take, take some old things that you know, or grab a hold of your mind, and say, God, take these. I, I don't want to think these things anymore. And start thinking new. Let God renew your mind, transform you. That's what Jesus wants to do. He forgave you. Let's pray. Jesus, you are so good. The fact that, that you would um, go through so much just to let us know that you love us, that, that, that you would go through suffering and pain and, and hardship because you want us to know that, 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 that we can lay down the old and take up something new, that we can trust you that we can look to you for truth so that we would be able to see the things in our lives that we hold on to that are false, and they're wrong, and they hurt us, and they hurt other people, and we know they're wrong, and we feel powerless to change. But Jesus, in you, we know that we can change. Help us today to walk away with a new hope. And not a hope that is just wishful thinking, but a hope that we can put into practice. And right now, as people think on your sacrifice, Jesus, let them see things in their life that they can give to you, old ways of thinking that they can just take off and new ways of thinking that they can just put on. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Good morning, everybody. How are we? You're very welcome. If it's your first time, you're very welcome with us. If you're tuning in for the first time, you're welcome too. Um, I just want to hit you with one or two announcements before we get into the service. On June 11th um, to the 18th, we're going on a missions trip to a very tropical, um, beautiful place, Poland. Um, so, uh, so if you're interested in that, have a chat with Justin. Um, that's going to be the 11th to the 18th. He'll be working with some of the refugee camps in in Poland. So if you're able to, to take time off and, and go to that, it'd be brilliant. Um, next week is St. Patrick's weekend. Uh, <laughs> so next week, so it's obviously on Friday, but as you well know, on Sundays you have the bands, the marching bands and stuff, which causes chaos in the traffic. So we're going to be posting about the traffic. Um, we're obviously still going to be here in person, but uh, if you're going to come, it's probably going to cause some delays or there's going to be some diversions or something. So just take that into consideration. Um, finally, if you're new to Elevate or you've been here for a period of time, um, we'd love to get to know you. So at one o'clock after the service today, um, we're going to do a little meet and greet. You can hang around after service and uh, we'll come up here and, and we'll just we'll chat. So if you're, if you're able to and you're new and you want to know more about us, because we'd like to know more about you, please feel free. Come. You're more than welcome. I think we have snacks, I think probably chicken nuggets, um, <laughs> probably, <laughs> um, but we'd have some tea, coffee, and chicken nuggets. Anyway, you're welcome. <laughs> so we're going to continue the series today um, that Justin kicked off last week um, entitled Winning the War in Your Mind. Now, why is that important? You know, we're, we're coming off the back of a series called Grow, and I know people want to grow, they need to grow, their, their desire is to grow, but how? How do you grow? And the answer to it is, it starts in the mind. It all starts in the mind. Now, we're not talking about positivity, right? We're not talking just about being positive, like the glass is half full. Hang in there, champ, you're going to make it through. That, that's not what we're talking about. The war in your mind isn't one with positivity. It's one with truth. The war in your mind is one with the truth, not just with being positive. Because there, there's a thing called toxic positivity. And that's when... Things are, your, your life just sucks, and you keep telling yourself, no, it's great. <laughs> right? That's toxic. You know, you're not facing the reality of what's in front of you. Toxic positivity isn't, it's not a good thing. Now, is it good just to think negatively? Of course not. But there's, there's a difference between lying to yourself and facing the truth. You know, that in our situations, it's not just about looking at it and saying, you know, things are good or things are bad. It's looking at the overall truth of, of where am I in life? Now, as Justin mentioned last week, you, know, you have to identify the strongholds that are holding you back. Now, sometimes during a service like this, you're asked a question like that, and you can you know, park the question maybe for a little bit, but you've had a week to think about this question. <laughs> Justin asked it last week. What are the strongholds that are holding you back? Have you come up with them? Like, have you actually thought about them? What's the strongest thought you have? See, because we mentioned last week that the direction of your life will always be moving towards your strongest thoughts. The direction of your life will always be, be represented by what's going on in your mind and, and, and in your life. See, you can't have a good life when you have a toxic mind. You can't do that. You can't have a good life when you have a toxic mind because the mind is almost like the engine of, of, of your life. See, this, this is where we all have to admit to something and take ownership. All of us have to, have to acknowledge this. You're responsible for your mind. It's probably the only aspect in your life that nobody else has access to. You're the only one who thinks what you think. You have full control. No one can hear your thoughts. You have full control over it. Now, what people can do is they can present you information, but it's up to you to let it in. They can present things, but it's up to you to, to live them out. As I said, the, the mind is kind of like a hard drive. How many of us have stopped a dream or a hope or a change or a desire long before it ever became a word, let alone an action, and we killed it in our minds because we stopped it? You know, we, we, we almost think ourselves out of it. And as I said, the mind's an engine. It, it's where our thoughts and perspectives and views and actions, that, that's, that's where it all stems from. See, the mind is conditioned a certain way, and we have to be able to compare how we think to what Scripture says. We have to. If you're a follower of Jesus this morning, th th this is what we have to do. We have to compare what it says. Now, my hope and prayer is by the end of this message, 
two things will have occurred. Two things. The first one is you'll believe it's possible. You'll believe it's possible to change how you think if it needs changing. Or if you already believe it, that you'll believe that you can, you can continue that change to be more Christ-like. See, we, we get to this by God's expectation of us to change. You're accepted by God no matter where you're at. That's the truth, right? No matter where you're at, you're accepted. But there is an expectation that if you become a follower of Jesus, you transform into his likeness. That, that's an expectation. The second thing that I hope you get when we, when we finish this message is the courage to actually be able to make the change. Because it's one thing to know you have to make a change. It's another thing implementing it, right? Like, it's one thing knowing you have to clean the house. It's another thing actually cleaning it. <laughs> like, it's one thing knowing you have to meet someone. It's another thing meeting them, right? We know what we have to do, but it's actually implementing it. And I suppose here's the underlying question that I would say most people never really sit down, pen and paper, prayerfully answer. What is it I have to change? What is it? Like, if we're meant to change or, or become more Christ-like, what is it we actually have to change in our life? Either eliminate, adjust, or adapt to actually become more Christ-like. What, what is it you need to change? What is it I need to change? See, one of the most encouraging things in my life that affirms my faith for me, and this happens probably, honestly, on a weekly basis. It actually is such an affirmation to my faith. I actually start smiling every single time I think about it because it just affirms Scripture so much. And this, this is the affirmation I get, right? I, I've spent about six years in an academic study of theology, and I love it. I absolutely love it. But later on, I spent about six years in academic study of therapy and, and, and psychology. And not once, not once, no, there's no exception I can think of, have I looked at something, whether it be in a, in a classroom or in a practice in psychology, that I can't find in Scripture. And it is the most encouraging thing because it makes sense. If Jesus is our Savior and God created us and he inspired the Word of God, it only makes sense that it would tell us how we should live, think, and act. Everything I've ever seen in psychology, I can find in Scripture. And to me, that is one of the most absolute affirmations of faith that, that I can point to. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't go to therapy. As a matter of fact, some of you probably, all of you should actually. You know, <laughs> I think about it, actually. <laughs> um, there's a list at the back. You put up your name and we'll get you hooked up. <laughs> right? I'm not stabbing, you know, this, but like the mental health issue, we all know it, right? Like of what's going on. And I'm, I'm not kidding when I tell you that everything that, that you see in therapy, you, you can find in the Bible. Now, I'm not saying don't you know, don't go to therapy, you should. But it, Scripture talks about it long before therapy ever came up with it. See, when, when you think about it, as I said, it, it, does, it makes sense. Because if God created us, it's not just about, you know, just, just pray it out. You know, if you're going through a problem, just pray it. Of course you should. But Scripture also gives us incredibly tangible, practical advice on how to implement it to have a better life. It tells us how to do it in a very, very practical way. Now, if you're open to change, you'll change. If you're not open to change, you won't change. It's that simple. You will if you want, and you won't if you don't want to. See, that old saying, we all know it, right? Asher, that's just the way they are. Right? Asher, there's no change in them. Or, you can't teach old dogs. We know the sayings, right? And what we're saying is, when we say that is, people can't change, and they can we can change. See, we have to rephrase it. No one can change if they don't want to. But you can change if you want to. And this is what the series is about. How do we win this war in our minds? Because we think, oh, well, that's just the way I am. No, that's the way you're choosing to be. If you put in enough intention and purpose, you can change. We all, we all can. It's not about a lack of ability to change. It's about a lack of desire to change. See, the Bible tells us this is true. Science tells us this is true. Your mother says this is true, right? It's true. Like we, we, we can see it. And we know it's true for ourselves. So what I want to, kind of want to do in the service this morning is I want, to, I want to blend the message into two aspects. To try and maybe practically show you how, the, how true this is. 
So what I want to I show you a short little video, if, if you'd allow me. And the video is on something called neuroplasticity. Now, neuro just means the mind. Plasticity means ability to change. I want to show you just a short little video on what science has come up with. They've spent billions and billions <laughs> on research to come up with this on how we can change. So if you bear with me and watch this, it's about just over two minutes. Take a look at this, and what I want to do after the video is, I want to look at this video from a biblical perspective, and how, yes, it can be done, but then what Scripture says about it. So take a quick look at this. Neuroscience is a biological science that is concerned with the function of the brain and the nervous system. For many years, scientists thought that the brain was fixed and couldn't adapt or change after childhood. But advances in fMRI scanning have shown that this could not be further from the truth. We can now see that our brains change and adapt every day, regardless of our age. Every time we learn something new, we're harnessing the power of neuroplasticity. Neuroscientists believe we have over 100 billion neurons in our brain, each capable of connecting to tens of thousands of others. Neurons are the building blocks of the brain and each one can make trillions of connections every second. When we learn a new skill or think about something differently, we begin to make new connections between neurons. Every time we practice a new skill, think in a certain way or feel a specific emotion, those related connections are then strengthened and it becomes easier for our brains to follow this pathway. If we keep using this pathway, our brains begin to adapt and this new way of thinking, feeling or doing becomes second nature. The less we use our old pathways, the weaker that pathway becomes. It's this ability to make new connections that has enabled scientists to coin the term neuroplasticity, meaning our brains are pliable and plastic and can grow, adapt and change. When we apply the neuroscience of learning with how the brain works, we can modify four variables to maximize the retainment of knowledge. These can be summarized as ages, attention, generation, emotion, and spacing. Attention. For us to be able to learn something, we need to pay attention to it. If we can't minimize distractions, then we can't focus on the learning and we won't remember it. Generation. This is where we encourage the learner to generate meaningful connections and associations with what they already know or a skill they already have. Help the learner to make those connections to previous learning and the wider context, and this includes the learner reflecting on their own learning process. Emotion. If we can attach emotion to the learning and help to motivate the learner with the rewards that they're going to gain from it or challenge them to get out of their comfort zone, they're much more likely to remember the information later on. Spacing. Spacing out the learning over time and using repetition and retrieval instead of chunking it into one big block will strengthen the learning and help to move it from short-term memory to long-term memory. With the trend for more courses moving towards endpoint assessment, this skill will be key in the achievement and success of our learners. Bet you weren't expecting that when you came to church this morning. <laughs> They've spent billions figuring this out in neuroscience and looking at the brain and, look, and hundreds of thousands, millions of people, these brain scans. And with all our technological advances, medically and psychologically and social sciences, they've come up with this acronym, AGES, and how we can change as people. I want us to look at scripture and how scripture is ahead of the curve on this. That if we just looked at scripture that says the exact same thing, scripture says this 2,000 years ago, and finally we're catching up with it. So look at it, AGES, attention. What did it, what did it say in the video? If we can't minimize the distractions, then we can't focus on learning it. That's what it said. It said we gotta get rid of the distractions, right? Firstly, in order to change, we have to be able to focus. Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, whatever is, if anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. If you wanna learn it, you have to focus on it. Scripture said this 2,000 years ago. If you want to change, you have, if you want to change it to something positive, you have to think about it. See, hands up here. Really, I want hands up, right? Hands up here who would say they're well able to meditate. No one. Okay. So nobody here is well able to meditate. All right. Okay. Hands up if you're well able to worry. 
Who, who here is well able to worry or you have worried? Don't be shy. Most of you, almost all of you. Worry is meditation on a negative aspect. That's all worry is. The definition of meditation is to focus one's mind for a period of time. Worry is just focusing on something negative. If you can worry, you can meditate. Meditation is just focusing. That's all it is. But the thing is we create our neural pathways by worrying and stressing and freaking out and jumping to overthinking and, and catastrophizing. And, and Scripture says, whoa, stop it. Focus on what is true, what is noble, what is right, what's pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, and praiseworthy. So that, that we don't automatically jump to something bad. See, Eastern meditation, or if you've ever been to any type of therapy, that you've probably come across mindfulness or, or meditation. Mostly kind of Eastern beliefs, maybe. It's all about emptying the mind, right? It's all about relaxing the mind. Whereas the difference in Christianity or biblical meditation, it's actually the quite the opposite. It's about filling your mind, but it's filling it with God's truth. It's actually about focusing on God's truth. So it's not emptying the mind, it's filling the mind with what God says. 2,000 years ago, Scripture tells us this. Finally, science catches up. The next thing it says is generation. The video said, we encourage the learner to generate meaningful connections and associations with what they already know. With what they already know. Surround yourself with people who will complement your attention to create the generation. So if you've been around church maybe for a little while, you already know a lot of this stuff. You, you, you already know. But it's to encourage you to associate that with what you already know. What does Scripture say about it? John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him. He who bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. 2,000 years ago, we're told that the primary generation is Jesus. The secondary is our community. That's, what we're, that's why we put Jesus first and we create community. But every single branch needs pruning. Just to mention that during his communion, you know, that, that we, we take off the old clothes and, and, and put on new ones, right? The problem is we become attached to the old, don't we? My middle daughter, Samantha, some of you know her, trying to get the woman to throw away something. Lads, you, 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 you've no idea. But it's my special shirt. <laughs> They're my special socks or whatever. Everything is special, right? Because what we're used to, we become attached to, even if it's not good for us. And that's why we're described as branches. We have to prune the branches. You have to look at your life or, or your way of thinking, and if it's not beneficial, you have to prune it. Jesus is divine. Where are the branches? We have to prune the branches. Now, pruning the branches means you might have to prune people out of your life. You might have to prune situations out of your life or habits or behaviors in order to focus what is good and what is pure and what's noble. Divine needs pruning. But our minds need pruning too. We need people who are around us who are willing to help us with pruning. The third one he mentions in the video is emotion. He says, if you can attach emotion to the learning and help to motivate the learner towards what they'll gain from. That's what he says in the video. See, gratitude, I think, is one of the most amazing feelings you can have when you think of somebody. Like, do you ever think of somebody and you're just grateful for them? I think that's one of the most beautiful compliments you can give somebody. Is just when they enter your mind, you're actually grateful that they're in your life. Scripture says this. You should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, that you should love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. See, one of the driving forces that we have in our life is that desire, that, that root to know God's un unconditional love. To know that God is there for us no matter what. And if we're focusing on positive, if we're, if we're drawn closer to God when we're re reading Scripture, if we can keep at the core, the foundation, we are loved by God. That when you open the Scriptures, no matter what aspect you're coming to God from, you are, you are loved and cared for, no matter what you've done or what you haven't done. It's a driving force that should motivate us to get to know God more. And when we feel like, you know, we can't make the change or it's too hard, remember that God loves us. That's the emotion, to be able to say that God loves us. 
And if you're a person or of character or virtue, and, and hopefully you can surround yourself with the right people to help motivate you towards this. See, knowing your love for God and knowing his love for you, hopefully should help you through the hard times when you're trying to make a change. But if you don't, you might have to ask other people. You might have to ask people to come into your life to help you with that change, that you want to make changes. See, adults are, are we're no different than kids, really. <laughs> like my kids, sometimes, not often, but sometimes there'll be a kid they'll bring to the house. And when they're gone, I'll tell one of my kids, don't, don't bring that peanut to my house anymore. That don't, don't bring that kid here. <laughs> like, don't do it. Why? Because there's either a behavior or an influence that I don't want them to have on my kid. Adults are no different. We're no different. We need to be very careful who we surround ourselves with because they'll have an influence on us. And we need to ask ourselves, are they pushing us towards God, towards this positivity, towards having a healthy mind, or are they dragging us down? And that's what we have to ask ourselves. Lastly, he talked about spacing. He says this, spacing out of the learning over time, space out the learning over time and using repetition and, and using repetition instead of chunking into one big block will strengthen your learning. What does he mean by that? He means doing it over and over again. What does scripture, what, what do we do as Christians? I'm going to sit down and read five chapters a day. I'm going to read five chapters a day, and I'm going to get through the Bible in a year. Well, actually, reading one verse a day and having it stick is better than reading five chapters and forgetting them. You, 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 it's not, a, it's not, a, it's not a, a race. It's, it's a marathon. It's long term. You don't have to do it in a day. If you can read one verse and remember it and apply it, it's better than reading five chapters. Just read one verse. Space it out. Space it out. What does Hebrews 5 say? For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need to, you need to teach, be taught again, the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers in discernment, trained in constant practice, and distinguish good from evil. See, the length of time you're a Christian has nothing to do with your maturity. Nothing. You could be a Christian for 50 years and not be mature. Because it's not about what you know, it's about applying what you know. Lots of people know stuff, but it's about allowing that change in your life to be lived out. You could be a Christian a month and be more spiritual mature than somebody who's been a Christian a long time. Why? Because you have to implement what you know and not just know it. It's what you focus on. It's what you're building your mind on. What, are you, what is it you're focused on? It's building those no, neural pathways not, not to be selfish. Stop thinking like that. It's to build them more towards what is good and what is righteous and what is right. Don't make the excuse, you know, I've gone too far. You know, it's, it's too late for me. We know biblically and scientifically and we know ourselves that's not true. See, if we take the mindset of I've gone too far or it can't be done, what about somebody who comes to faith later in their life? What about somebody who comes to faith maybe in whenever, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever? Are you telling them they can't change? Are you saying to them, actually, God can't have an impact on you? Why? You know, because you've been that way so long. That is completely unbiblical. Completely. So the truth of the matter is, anyone can change. You might have X amount of decades of habits, but we can change. And it's only through the power of the Holy Spirit that we can do it. But the big question is, will you change? Will you? There's a, a gentleman by the name of John Maxwell. He wrote a book, but he says in, in the book, there's four, generally there's four main reasons people change. He says, when people hurt enough, they have to. When people see enough, they're inspired to. When people learn enough, they want to. And when people receive enough, they're able to. Which one of those do you fall into? Why, why would you want to change? Because if you can worry, you can meditate. And if you can meditate, you can change. It's all about focusing on what is good and pure. I want to wrap up with, with us being able to identify some of these things that we might need to change. Because for some of us, our internal clock, your, your kind of internal um, dialogue right now is, 
I believe what you're saying is true for everybody else. I believe what you're saying is true, but you don't know my personal situation. You don't know exactly what I've gone through. You, you don't know exactly where I'm from. And that's true, I don't. But these principles apply no matter what. Because some of us are living and applying our lives on the facts of our life rather than the truth of our life. And there's a difference between facts and truth. There's a huge difference between facts and truth. What do I mean? The fact is, you may feel alone. That's a fact. You're feeling it. But the truth is, God is always with you. That's the truth. The fact is, you feel alone, but the truth is, God is always with you. The fact is, you might feel unlovable. The truth is, you are loved by God. The fact is, you lack self-worth. The truth is, God thought you were worthy enough to die for. The fact is, you might have gone through a trauma. The truth is, God is a healer. The fact is, you feel defeated. The truth is, we have victory in Christ. Do you see the difference? You might be living out of your facts, but they may not be the truth. And the thing is, we make our decisions, we choose our lifestyle, we choose the direction we want to go, and how we feel, and that's a huge mistake. We have to base it on the truth of God, not on the facts of ourselves. See, we need to write this down. We need to write it out. We need to lay it out. We need the facts of our life on paper, but we need to battle the facts with the truth. You need to write these out, whatever you're going through. See, I don't know the battle you're facing in your mind. I don't know the battle you're going through. I, I have no idea. But here's the truth I do know. Romans 12, 2. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be what? Transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the truth. We need to renew it. And there's no exception. And if you think you're the exception, that's what you need to work on. <laughs> you're not the exception to this. So what's the application? Take out a pen. Here's the application. Whatever it is you're battling with, whether it be the facts or how you feel, you need to write it out. Write it out, think it, confess it, until you believe it. Write out what you're feeling and compare it to Scripture. That's how we renew our minds. So if you feel that you're going down to, down to you know, negative station, if you're, if you're going to negative town, you need to realize that. Write it out and combat your facts with the truth. Because the truth is, you are loved by God. You are wanted by God. God did that. That's the truth. And I know for some people, maybe the battles in their mind are maybe a little bit more complex, right? Maybe there, there's a little bit more going on than, than just this bird's eye view. But I promise you this. There isn't one aspect of what you're going through that Scripture does not relate to. It's just finding the truth. And that's why, I mean, being in a, a home group, being in a, a small group, being a part of the church is so important. Because when we have that repetition, we can bounce this off of people, and they'll know and discover the truth together. So my hope and my prayer is, as, as you leave today, that you'll believe change is possible, that whatever you're battling in your mind might be a fact, but it needs to be replaced with the truth. What you're feeling is a fact, but we need to rely on God's truth to the point that when those thoughts come, you're, you're able to combat them with the truth. The problem is we don't arm ourselves with the truth. You remember when Jesus went into the desert and he was tempted by Satan? No? Okay. There's a chapter in the Bible where Jesus goes into the desert and he's tempted by Satan. What was Jesus' response to every single accusation of Satan? It is written. It is written. I don't feel loved. It is written God loves you. I feel defeated. It is written you're victorious in Christ. It is written. But unless you know what is written, you can't combat the accusations, even from ourselves. Truth be told, let's take it one step further. Even from our families. Maybe you're in a toxic family. Maybe you're in a toxic friendship or a toxic relationship. You need to trust who you are in Christ, not what others say. So my prayer is that we'll have the courage this week to sit down and lay this out and actually start that change in our mind that's needed. Let me pray. God, thank you that you, it's just so encouraging. It's just so unbelievable that down to the very details of who we are and how we think, you've written it in your word. That wonderfully and, and, and 
gloriously science is caught up with this, but your word tells us it all along and how we need to change and should change, but more so how to change. I pray you give each and every one of us the courage to do it in whatever areas we need to change. We all need to change differently, maybe. But I pray you give us the courage and the ability to do so. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Would you guys stand with us? We're going to close out with a song called See a Victory. And just as Dermot was talking, I think it's just a good reminder that when we're focusing on God and when we're uh, choosing to follow him, we can see the victory in him. what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good, you turn it for good, you take what the enemy meant for evil, but you turn it for good, you turn it for good, oh, every time, every time, you take what the enemy meant for evil. Turn it for good. You turn it for good. Oh, thank you, God. Thank you, God. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. Oh, oh, you take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it for good. You turn it.
We just pray that this week, Lord Father, as um, we renew our minds in you, Lord Father God, that we would um, believe the truth that you have over us, Lord God, that uh, these words that we sing, Lord Father, aren't just words that stay here and then we come back next week and we haven't lived them or believed them at all, Lord Father. God, I pray that this week, Lord, we would be reminded, Lord, that as we seek after you, as we put you as our foundation, Lord Father, as we renew our minds in you, Lord God, Father, yours is the victory, God, and you have the victory over our lives, Lord Father, the victory over our circumstances, God, and because you hold us and you know us, God, and we thank you for that. Thank you for this morning and this time together with your people, God, and I just pray many blessings on each and every single person. Amen. Guys, thank you so much for being here this morning. Just a quick reminder of the meet and greet here at one o'clock. It's here in this room, Dermot, yeah? Yep, uh, just up here at the front. And help yourself to tea and coffee, and there's loads of cake. I'm after eating like about five slices. So please eat it before I eat it all. <laughs> and we'll see you next week. <laughs>